reach, inspire, and transform. NASM Optima 2021 Virtual Conference. Our biggest and best Optima yet. Three full days of learning. More than 100 virtual sessions. Inspiring speakers you can't miss. Challenging workouts to master your skills. Nutrition and lifestyle facts. The best community network. And for the first time ever, with free full online access. At Optima 2021. Find out more and register today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Random Fit. I am Wendy Batts, and I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Ken Miller. Ken, how are you today? Good, Wendy. How's it going? Oh, it's going very well. Um, today's podcast is one that touches my heart in so many ways. I have known this athlete since he was just a little guy, and he is truly an inspiration. He is a world record holder in both the 800 and 1500 meters, he won gold in the IPC World Championship and Parapan Olympic Games, was named Athletic Canada's Ambulatory Athlete of the Year in both 2018 and 19, and most recently won gold in the 1500 meters at the 2020 Paralympic Games in Tokyo. So please help me welcome Nate Reach to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Wendy. Oh, thanks, Nate, for being here. Yeah, so, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I know that uh, I know you're probably extremely exhausted um, from all the travels and probably all the partying after winning all your medals. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, with with it being such a whirlwind for you and, you know, I know that you probably haven't had enough time to recover. But can you tell us about your experience in Tokyo and what it was like? Yeah, definitely. It was it was super fun. Um, you know, we're going in there. I felt like we were going in there pretty blind. Like I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I knew there was going to be a lot of COVID tests. Um, thankfully, <laughs> I was able to have my uncle, uh, Trevor Harrison, uh, be on the treatment staff, which was uh, something that I know would really help my performance. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't really think about the race really until three days um, before. And it seemed like three days before the pressure uh, hit me like a ton of bricks and I was like, holy <laughs> smokes, uh, I guess we're going to do this thing in, 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 in three days. And I think I was so focused on the outcome. And so I talked with my sports psychologist and we just really focused on um, making that 10 year old in the hospital bed really proud because I think at that time I didn't know what opportunities would, would, would be there for me. And, um, and so I was just really happy to execute my race plan and, um, you know, the race was a bit um, shocking. I, I assumed that they would kind of go with my move. And I obviously, as a runner, you try to catch the field by surprise. And fortunately, that's what I did. And, uh, you know, when I crossed that line, so much emotion. Uh, I always I was telling my buddies after the race, I kept screaming and I kept telling <laughs> myself to not scream. And then the screaming kept coming out of my voice. And I was like, Nate, stop, calm down. Um, but it was it was such a cool experience. Now, thanks for sharing that, Nate. And again, thank you for being with us here on Random Fit. Um, a lot of us, you know, when when we watch events like yours and and the the Olympics overall and the Paralympics, a uh, lot of what we don't get a chance to see and get exposure to is the preparation. Can you tell us about how you prepare? And you've competed on the world stage before, so can you tell us a little bit how you prepared for the for the olympics and and if this was any different than other competitions that you've done yeah definitely i think the preparation um you know as in we don't get to do anything outside of training i feel like as an athlete you always want to have kind of a getaway um and so that was one thing we had to be kind of creative with because we weren't able to really go outside or do much besides training um but for for me, I have a couple of buckets that I find really important. Obviously, the actual running training um, and then the lifting, which uh, I use the OPT model, which obviously you two are very familiar with. Um, and I've used that since I was a very little kid. And, you know, having our sport being on one leg at all times, um, a lot of that single leg balance stuff is really important. And as well as we're such an overuse sport. Um, and we're only going in, 
you know, one direction. And so I find it really important to go in all different planes when I'm lifting. Um, unfortunately, you know, I have Trevor to, to write my programs and I've always thought that being really important to me. And then the, the mental side, um, which is equally as important as the actual running side, because if you can't um, execute or you feel like you have a parking brake on your mind and you can't run, run freely, that's a huge problem. Um, and for me, I come from a very athletic family. And so I think, you know, there was a lot to learn, a lot of information. And so you really decipher and find out which information works for you. Um, and for me, I, I used to think I need to get pumped up for a race. Um, but actually, I need to come down. Like, I listen to country music. Like, I am super chill before my race. I listen to some Chris some, some Chris Stapleton and just chill. So um, that's kind of what preparation looks like uh, for me. And I'm a very kind of silly, like to joke around. And so I try to keep it as light as possible. That's awesome. And uh, yes, if you guys knew Nate's family, you would know exactly what he's talking about. Um, but, you know, Nate, I think it's important for people to understand how we, we meaning like we got to this point. I mean, how did you become um, a para, you know, athlete? So can you kind of tell us about your story and uh, what happened when you were 10? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, growing up, like I said, I had a very athletic family. Um, I remember um not learning that like doing wind sprints in the street wasn't normal at 5 a.m until i was about eight years old i just thought that that's what your parents did in the morning like you would all work out together um and so i i played um baseball was kind of my favorite sport growing up growing up in phoenix arizona um with the diamondbacks being good in 2001 that was kind of the sport i i, I drifted towards and on a sunny hot day in July in 2005, I was playing golf with a bunch of my friends. And I, to be fully honest, I think we were driving our parents crazy. So I think they kind of pushed us out to the golf course and said, why don't you guys go do something with all this energy you have? And on the seventh hole, um, an older gentleman asked to play through and they were kind of taking care of us. So they said, hey, why don't you hit your balls and go stand um, over under, the, under this tree? It was in the rough about 150 yards to the left. And I remember um, still to this day, I remember the sound of the SQ Nike driver. It kind of sounds like a tin trash can when you hit it. And the next thing I remember is like just a tingly sensation running through my body. I get a lot of questions like, did you faint? No, I stood up the entire time, never fell down, called my mom. Um, whoever knows my mom, um, you know, she's, uh, she a very tough bargain. So she, I called her, said, Hey, I just got hit by a golf ball. Um, can you come pick me up? And she was like, Nate, you're being dramatic. And I was very dramatic kid. So I definitely <laughs> won't, won't pretend like I, I wasn't. So she was seemed a bit annoyed to come pick me up. But, um, when I got there, she's like, Hey, I'm gonna take your friends home first so that they were all, we we're all 10. So we don't want them to be nervous at the hospital. And then we will, um, take you to Phoenix Jones hospital. And by the time I got to the hospital, I had become fully paralyzed on the right side of my body. I couldn't get out of the car or out of the car. I was limping. And then when we got back to the hospital room, um, I had, I had a seizure and that was kind of my like, Oh crap moment. Like, um, what's going on. I remember shaking uncontrollably and also trying to talk, but thinking I was talking, but nothing coming out or no one understanding me. And then my mom's sprinting out of the hospital room. And my mom is, very strong woman and never, never really have seen her freaked out. Um, so that was really interesting. And I think uh, it was a really tough time. I was in the hospital for a month. Um, lots of, lots of PT, um, you know, lots of long days learning how to do things that you think are so easy, like writing or walking or um, trying to tie your shoe or putting your clothes on. Those things are really tough for me. And um, fortunately, I, I seemed to get better pretty fast after about two weeks. It, like, it seemed like the recovery came fast and then I didn't really get much better after that. Um, there was, you know, I think I just need to start using my leg, but I think the most, um, I think fundamental part of my entire life was when I had the exit interview um, with my doctor. He said, Nate, you'll never walk without a limp and competitive sports are not in your future. And I think at that moment, I still get chills um, even when I say it, um, I feel like there's just two roads you go down. You go down this smooth road that's easy. There's not a lot of failure, but also those you don't get those high moments. 
or you go down this kind of bumpy, dark road that you don't know what's going to happen, but you know there's going to be a lot of failure, and you know if you succeed, it's going to feel so special. And so um, I was definitely with a shove from my mom, um, ready to go, to go down that dark, windy road. So, and I've worked in the rehab environment, and I know the rehabilitative or the going through the rehabilitation process is different for everybody. What do you remember about those initial days and weeks as far as getting strength back and, and like, as you mentioned, uh, relearning how to do some of those basic things? So you've had experience with physical therapists and I'm sure occupational therapists as well. Yeah, absolutely. It, I remember it just being extremely frustrating, to be fully honest with you. Uh, I remember just those things you just take for granted. They're so hard. And my right side was my dominant arm, especially being a pitcher. Um, you know, that right arm was the arm that um, was affected the most. So I had to relearn how to do everything with my left hand. And um, I'm definitely, Wendy can uh, 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 corroborate my story that I'm a very fiery individual. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't like help all the time. I like to, um, you know, especially when you're that age, you don't like, especially when you're trying to walk, like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I don't need help. But I did need help and it was really frustrating. I was, I was in a wheelchair for a couple of weeks and um, yeah, I, any, any opportunity when I got to walk, they're like, Oh, you're, you might get tired. I'm like, uh, I'm walking. I'm not getting back on that wheelchair. There's, that is not happening. So um, I think, uh, I think I needed to, I think I learned some patience when I was not, was when I was in the hospital because as sport will teach you just life, um, it doesn't come the way you want it to come. It comes the way it's supposed to. And, a lot of times it's slower than you really hope for. <laughs> Those of you guys that are joining us, we're here today with Nate Reach, and he is a Paralympic athlete, and he has won all kinds of you know uh, medals and break, like breaks records. It seems like every time he gets on the track, he is an amazing individual, and he has just told us a little bit about his story. Um, but I've got a follow up question to that, Nate. You know, I know that rehab it was super frustrating as you just mentioned and stuff but what what effects do you have day to day now i mean how does it truly affect you yeah so my um my right hand and arm uh don't work that well my mom always teases me to to use it but i just got so good at using my left hand um that i mostly use my left side uh, my leg is still affected um i I definitely get pretty jacked up after training just because I'm turning left. So my left side gets overused, but my right side gets really tight from all the training that we do. Um, Cause I still train about 60 miles a week. So I'm still, still pretty intense training. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that's pretty hard. And then I think the big, the hardest part to understand is the brain is when I get fit, when I get fatigued, when I go over that red line, it is game over. I am I have to take four or five days off. Like uh, my nervous system is just fried, and so we found that speed work is something that really fries my system. So instead of um, doing that on the track, a lot of times we do it in the gym. We do a lot of power um, with like med ball throws and, and things like that. And so you know, with training, it's um, you kind of learn the recovery profile and then you try and find ways to still get the training that, that you need, but not overdoing it. And it's definitely a balancing act. It's uh, tough at times. Now, Nate, Nate that's a, uh, that's a lot of mileage, <laughs> 60, <laughs> miles, 60 miles a week. Um, can you tell us about, okay, so what goes into your recovery process? Because if I had if I had a client that ran that amount of mileage on, on a weekly basis, you know, I'd be encouraging them, you know, you know, let's get you in some Norma tech booth. Let's get you on some percussion. Let's get you on, you know, let's what, what's your corrective exercise program like. So what's, what does it take for you to, to recover from that volume of training? Because that's not normal. That's <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it starts prior to the session. Um, prior to the session, um, I usually get to the track about an hour and a half before my workout. Um, I have my corrective program. I'm basically front, right, back, left. Um, I, like my quad gets really tired on my right side, and then my uh, glute and hamstring. Um, really, my bicep fem on the left side is kind of my big problem because we turn left so much. 
Um, so yeah, I have that corrective program oh, and then with a lot of uh, single leg balance and reach, TKEs, um, so that kind of stuff. And I will not run without doing my corrective program. I am super stingy on that. All my teammates laugh at me. They're like, oh, there's Nate with his uh, with his foam roller and, and all of his uh, mini bands. So um, that's kind of how I start my session. And then post-session, um, we'll cool down. And then uh, directly after, I'll jump on the foam roll. I just do a foam roll and stretch um, just to – um, get my muscles back to feeling good because I don't like to jump in the Normatec and use the Mark Pro um, unless I've rolled prior. And that's a protocol that um, Trevor has given me as well as Tony uh, when he's my husband. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what my my protocol looks like. I love polar plunges. Um, so I'll, I, 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 I do that as well. Um, we do a lot of the Wim Hof breathing and things like that. So um, me and my teammate, Tom, um, who a lot of our teammates think we're a bit uh, crazy, but I mean, we are, but um, so <laughs> we, we enjoy, we enjoy doing that together. I love it. I'm so proud of you. Um, and I'm sure Tony and Trevor are as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that would be for a long time. <laughs> I know. And we know where to find you, Nate. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I guess, can you explain, you know, the process, you know, in order to get into the Paralympics, there's a qualification process. Um, so can you kind of go through, because if you, you know, you look at your stats and everything and you see something like T38 or you see these numbers, can you kind of, you know, inform us of, of, of how do you get these qualifications, what that stuff means? Definitely. So you have to have uh, an international classification. It's called to compete um at any international event and so my class is the coordination impairment so that's from t34 to t38 and the higher so t stands for track and 38 is the highest um, classification so it's the uh, most functioning uh on yeah most mobility uh and so for me classification looks like it's a pretty long and uh, stringent process. You have to get on the table first and you do a range of motion test. Um, and then um, you do a lot of agility and like hopping. Um, Cause a lot of times the athletes either have CP or have a tra traumatic brain injury. Um, those are kind of the, the two that dominate the, the classification. Um, and then they take you to the track the following day to see your practice. And then um, the following day after that, they watch you race and so you know sometimes you can we've had problems where people faking it and things like that um and then so in a race you you, you usually never fake it because you have to um react to moves and things like that and then they also look at brain scans and stuff on the first day and so um i have a hole in my head so um that <laughs> definitely helps my case um and uh, wendy knows i may use that excuse a little bit more than i should um, but, uh, but yeah, that's kind of what the process looks like. And then they, they post, uh, either you get in or you don't get in, um, on, uh, near, near the track post race. So you, you're just kind of waiting and, you know, hopefully, um, you qualify and it's just weird it being in someone else's hands. Um, so it's definitely a bit, a, a bit stressful for sure. So once you're in, are you in, or do you have to do this every year? Uh, every cycle, so a cycle, okay. every Olympic cycle, which is four years. Well, usually four years. It'll be three this uh, this this next year, and so I'll get classified again. Um, but I'm a um, from what the classifiers have said, I'm a I fit in the in the T38 class pretty perfect and very uh, similar to the other um, disabilities within our class. So um, I'm pretty I'm pretty confident that uh, that I'll be good for this next cycle. All right. I, 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 can I ask another follow-up question? And this is just personal. Like, we need you on Team USA, dude. So why Team Canada? <laughs> yeah, no, I think uh, I that I'm, I will not be running for, for, for Team USA, Wendy. So uh, I apologize. Come on. But, uh, <laughs> but my mom, who on a serious note, who's done everything uh, for me and, and pushed me, um, you know, I wanted to do it as uh, respect for her because she had me um, in the middle of her career. Um, and I feel like the sacrifices she made for me um, did not allow her to compete to the level that I know she, she could have. And so it was a uh, thank you for everything you've done for me. Um, and I've always wanted to run for Canada, just uh, 
is how much time. My mom and I have a very special re- re- relationship. I feel like when you get paralyzed and you're kind of near that that edge of you know possibly never walking again, I think it's uh, you just create a very um, u- unique bond. And so yeah, I was so happy to be able to represent the country that uh, she she grew up in. That's awesome. Right. Thanks for that. Um, all all mothers should hear <laughs> something <laughs> like that. Um, that. That's 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 uh, that's awesome. So here, we're here with Nate Reach, uh, 2020 Paralympic uh, gold medalist. Uh, so Nate, so talking about your your choice to uh, run for Team Canada, what goes into um, being a part of that national team what's can you tell us a little bit about that experience as far as being a part of a, a, a national team and representing a whole country yeah it's it's uh it's super fun first off um so i train at the west hub in victoria british columbia um so they have a facility with the track with the gym uh physiologist uh department upstairs we were, where we do our vo2 max testing um, so you have a lot of perks um, like that and like a lot of our travel um, and accommodation gets paid for when we go on trips. I'm on the road um, usually about five or six months out of the year. Um, we do a lot of training usually in Phoenix for at least a month or two and then Flagstaff for altitude training. Um, and then my favorite place of training is Chula Vista. California, just because um, at the former Olympic Training Center, they just have everything in one place. They have you know the dining hall, they have the track right down the stairs, a huge gym, and also you're surrounded by Olympic and Paralympic gold, gold, gold medalists pretty much everywhere you look, and it's multiple sports. And so yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. And um, there are pre camps that we are strongly uh, suggested to to go to prior to the championships. So usually it's two to three weeks um, prior to those championships in that same time zone in that country most of the time. Um, And so that's kind of what it looks like. But I have my own personal coach. Um, She is actually the uh, able body Olympic distance coach. So um, it makes it pretty easy for me because she knows all the behind the scenes stuff. So that makes it really easy for me. And honestly, I wouldn't want to run for anyone besides Heather. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go back to uh, another personal question. You know, we've got this bond, Nate. So, um, you know, you do come from a background, obviously a family of elite athletes. And I know we've talked about it, but just for our listeners to understand, when we say that Nate comes from like some pure blood, amazing people, we've got his, you know, dad was an Olympian. Mom was a pole vaulter for Team Canada. Grandfather played professional hockey. You've got your grandmother competed in equestrian for Canada. Your uncle played professional rugby. Uh, you've got cousins that competed in the Olympics. You've got stepdad that's a professional baseball player. Stepmom who also was in the Olympics. And and that's just to name a few guys, just a few. And so if you think about this, um, you know, Nate, I guess one of the questions that I have was, did you do you feel like pressure to succeed? Like, did you have to do this? <laughs> or, you know, was your family just pushing you, pushing you? Or was this all you and they're just there for support and guidance? Definitely. I don't think I ever knew anything different. Like, I, I never felt like I was pressured to do anything. Um, and a lot of people like always ask about the pressure. And I just, I don't think anyone can put more pressure on myself than, than I put on myself. Um, and to be fully honest with you, seeing them compete so well when I was so young, I wanted that pressure because I know if I was, if I was doing well, then I would have that pressure. And so I feel like that's something that I, my mom's been preparing me for. So, so as my stepdad then, um, and so, uh, no, I don't think they pushed me into it. Um, I did, um, want to have my own twist on my career. I definitely didn't know that a golf ball would hit me and that kind of would be done for me. I thought maybe um, I would have to do a different event or different sport. Um, so that's kind of why I did baseball er- early on because it wasn't track and field and I kind of grew up at the track. So, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it's funny the twists and turns that life takes you on and um, I couldn't be more happy to uh, be a part of the Paralympics. And I think one of the coolest things is I feel like this generation is the first generation getting to know about the Olympics and the Paralympics as kids. And I love when I get to talk to those kids and 
be able to, you know, I know a lot of, about the Olympics. I have so many Olympians in my family, but, but I can also share the amazing stories of other Paralympic athletes who I've had the opportunity to meet. So I think it's a really cool um, opportunity to be able to share that with uh, this next next generation. Now, Nate, that's, that's awesome. Um, and I was going to save this question for later, you know, as far as your influence on kids. And, and again, we have Nate Reach here. Uh, uh, Paralympic 2020 gold medalist. Um, you've done some work with um, the Miracle Network. Can you tell us more about what you do to influence kids and, and get them involved with sport and activity and, you know, helping them, you know, progress into chasing their dreams when it comes to uh, physical sport? Yeah, absolutely. So Children's Miracle Network um, is a, uh, a company that fundraises money uh, uh, and all the fundraisers are done locally. So all the money stays locally, which is something that was really attractive to me. Um, and I felt like they had a big hand in helping me recover because of all the resources that Phoenix Children's Hospital had. And so my mom um, had asked me if I felt comfortable public speaking at golf tournaments. Um, and I had a really bad stutter and I got, um, I hate using the word bullied, but I got made fun of a lot growing up for it. And so that was definitely a big fear of mine. Um, and then I found out how much I enjoyed it. And I feel like sometimes you don't get your passions till later in life. And by be, being paralyzed and seeing all, seeing how great Phoenix Children's Hospital was, it created a passion of helping kids have as positive of an experience as they can it, in the hospital. So in college, um, I when I was in the hospital, I found when athletes would come and do homework or play video games with me, I found that made me feel normal. Um, and so now I like to go and go to local hospitals uh, in college. I volunteered, I think it was five to six hours a week. And I would go and do homework with them and um, go and play video games, which I always lost, which was um, a pretty, pretty competitive. And it was funny how much I would get my butt kicked. Um, but, uh, but yeah, those are the things I like to do. And I, I love to um, help the next generation of Paralympic athletes because a lot of times they see Brent Lacatos, who's a, the best, one of the best wheelchair athletes of all time on the track. Or you see Greg Stewart, who won shot put for Team Canada. And you don't know actually what those stepping stones are to get there. And so um, in Canada, in the U.S., we're really pushing for uh, more grassroots root programs. And obviously, there needs to come funding with that as well. And so um, I've really enjoyed just... I'm sharing with people um, what that what that looks like, and I've never met someone who doesn't like Paralympic sport. They just don't know about it, and they don't understand it. And so um, I feel like education is kind of that next step. What we really need to do. Oh, I love it, Nate. You're so special. I just I don't know everything about you. I just oh I love this kid. You guys love him. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm going to switch gears again and and kind of take us back to your training, Nate. Um, you know, obviously, you know, you growing up with some of the top practitioners in the world, you know, you've had, you know, access to the NASM OPT model pretty much your whole life. So how would you attribute like the, the corrective exercise and the stabilization work that you do? I know you were talking about balance and how important that is when you're running, but just all in all, you know, you know, obviously we talk a lot about alignment and it's, it's not just at your foot and ankle, it's everything. So how would you attribute like your corrective exercise programming and all the different phases of training that you've done to help make you successful in your career. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I think I remember when it first kind of came into uh, my world, which was around nine, nine or 10. And uh, I remember just being like interested in what this model was. And I think it being such an integrated model is something that always was really attractive to me, especially the treatment side goes with the, with the strength side. It's, a lot of times, especially in college, I noticed that um, a lot of times everyone wasn't on the same page um, with the strength and treatment side. And so that's something that was also always super attractive to me. And uh, my stepdad, uh, Ben Tucker, who worked for NASM at one time, him and I were talking the other day and he said, you know, um, would the OPT model be in the top five most important things to your performance? And I said, absolutely. I mean, I would think it would be in the top three. Um, just because it keeps me healthy. And at the end of the day, if you keep getting hurt, you can only get back to that level where 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 you were. And if you don't get hurt, you're con continuing to excel and excel and, and getting better. And so um, I really 
um, think that it's helped me stay healthy. And at, at the end of the day, I feel like the stability work is so important. And I keep that stability work in for the entire year because a lot of times we're, we're racing a lot. And a lot of times when you get fatigued, that's, that stability seems to be the first thing that goes later in the season. Um, and so I stability is um, sometimes not the most um, like sexy or um, exciting uh, thing to do, but I think it is one of the most important things that I do in training. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, you know, and, and that's a hundred percent true about stability. You know, the more you work and again, you're versed more so on the training side and as far as the whys for the progression of, as, as Mindy mentioned it before, stability, strength, and power. And you understand the value of stability training for what it does for you in the later training phases before competition. Can you tell us about any other modifications or any other considerations that you take into, you know, you weigh into your training more than what other athletes might do into their training? Yeah, I think um, in the weight room, we definitely – have had to get creative because my right hand grip strength is horrible um, and I need to get some form of strength. And so I've worked a lot with Tony and Trevor. Uh, we do some of the trap bar. Um, I can't really do any form of squats or I pull my left hamstring. Um, so we've really had to, you know, put a box under the trap bar so that I don't go down as deep because that I, the 1500, one unique thing about it is that you have to do everything. You have to do power. You have to do speed. You have to do the endurance work. You have to do the strides on the grass. It's like you kind of have to do everything um, because it at, at the championship races, a lot of times we just jog around and sprint the last 400 meters. Um, so you, you have to have that anaerobic ability as well. And so getting that strength and then obviously getting that power with the med ball is super important. I think that's um, one thing that is underutilized in track and field. But yeah, I think just having to be creative. Am I using something to support my wrists? My wrist is really weak too. Um, so yeah, just finding ways to get that strength on. And it's been challenging at times, um, for sure. We, um, and sometimes it's, 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 it's frustrating, but, um, but yeah, we just keep, um, kind of tinkering with that. And, um, and yeah, it's, uh, it, Turned out this year, it seemed like we really got it right. I ended up having a huge PB, and I haven't PB'd in three or four years. And so um, wow. it, it was great when everything kind of came together. And the pandemic kind of helped my training um, because I feel like every year you're trying to get healthy and trying to get ready for those championships. And those are solid dates. Like, it doesn't matter. You can't take that time off that you need. Um, and so that was um, good for me. And I think it taught me a lot to actually be patient. Like you don't need to run fast during the year as long as you run fast when it matters. Um, and so that's that's something that I really took into my training. I didn't really like sometimes I would get mad if we weren't doing the, the proper workout or like I would have to, have to talk with my coach because like as, as a runner, we like to go fast and not all the time go long. Um, and so that's something that she really taught me this year and my coach Heather. And so, and then all of a sudden we just, I PB like three races in a row and I had never really done that before. And I was like, wow, this is fun. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, I've been in the sport for 16 years and I'm still like learning so, so much. And it's, uh, and it's pretty crazy. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I know I've read a story, Nate, I know we've actually had a conversation about this actually when you were in college and I know that there was other uh, coaches that you had that had different forms of training to the point to where you, you started not to like running and you almost quit. So can you kind of tell us, I mean, you just kind of told us about Heather and what she was able to do to, to help you PB and then get to where you are today. But, you know, at that moment in your life, when you were in college, can you kind of walk us through, you know, when you were about to hang up the cleats and say, I'm done versus that getting that second win, like, okay, I, I'm, this really is what I love to do. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, um, it was hard in college to stay healthy just because, I mean, Trevor, you know, as a college athlete, we don't make any money or anything. So, like, I can't just have him flying out every week to give me treatment. And, and you know, we did our best that we could do with the corrective program. And I stayed healthy most of the time. But in running, it's like this mentality of the more you run, the better you're going to be. Um, and for me, I believe the better the movement quality you have, the better you're going to be. 
and we're going to do enough training. Like there's so many athletes who are overtrained. And I think that's why you saw such a huge, um, like resurgence in American distance running during the pandemic is because I felt like everyone got rest. And so for me, I was just, I just felt like I was beat up all the time and I wasn't really getting better. And that's kind of in, in a sport when I'm not getting better. I, that's kind of when I feel like it's time to go, but um, I always feel like I've leaned into my adversity and um, always wanted to see what was on the other side. And so um, after college, um, I really just wanted Trevor to be involved um, because every coach, it seemed like, didn't want Trevor to be involved. And I knew if I could get Trevor to be involved in the writing, the lifting and on the treatment side, then I could run so much faster. And um, fortunately, that's that showed this year, which was super cool. And, you know, like, like every sport, I feel like there's always years where it's, where it's tough and maybe you're doing the same thing. And I think that's maybe why the move to Canada was, was really good for me. It gave me a new perspective and it gave me new teammates. And uh, yeah, I just, I just love running again, which is super fun. And I'm taking my two weeks off right now and uh, I'm starting to definitely inch to kind of get back into training just because I love it so much. And my brother, Max, who is 16, is running cross country and track. So um, him and I are now able to go on runs. It's like the first time that we can kind of go on runs together. So yesterday we got to go do a 20 minute run, which was super fun. And uh, yeah, I'm just loving the sport so much. Nice, nice. Now, let, let me ask you this, Nate. I mean, not everybody has a chance to have a Trevor or a Wendy or a Tony in their lives when it comes to you know staying in shape performing at their their highest levels um and you know you you mentioned you, you know you and your brother cross country running and my my kids are doing cross country and i mean they're eight and ten but um since you know you've had trevor in your life not everybody has a trevor in their life and he's been one of the one of the best practitioners i've had a chance to uh, work alongside in the past so i know what you have access to for that person that doesn't have that in their life, what what key points would you say that they should incorporate when it comes to how you've benefited from from this level of training uh, to get you to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, first off, formal stretch and activation. Don't just stretch like it's such an integrated model that they have to be done. You stretch first, or sorry, you foam roll first, you stretch, and then you activate. I think that is so important. And like I said before, I will never run without doing my corrector program um, because number one you just feel so much better and you definitely stay healthy longer and then when it comes to in the weight room do stability before you're doing any, any of those heavy lifts you need to have that foundation and that is something that has also kept me kept me healthy over the years and a lot of times i'll run after i do stability because i just feel so good i feel like all the muscles in my body are working together and I think those are the two um, components for me that are the most important. And I think uh, just never stop learning. Um, you know, I, I learned so much from Wendy, Tony, Trevor, and everyone who works on Trevor's staff. I'm always asking questions, um, you know, especially because the body is so funny how integrated things are and how if your big toe is off and it turns out your foot, then, then, then your problems get really tight and then it goes up to my bicep them and I'm like, oh. It's so annoying. It's my it's my big toe for for good for goodness sakes. But uh, you know, I think if you learn and then you can tell when something's tight, instead of going and smashing a workout on the track, you'd be like, "Hey, coach, I think it might be good to take the morning off and let's like get some treatment. Let's get all my ranges, um, or just foam roll and stretch if you don't have access to treatment." Um, and that's I think that's that's one thing that I've really used during the pandemic. Like there were some days where like, "Hey, coach, I can't work out today." My whoop says my recovery isn't good, as well as my body just doesn't feel good. So let's let's just kind of take today off, and then we'll get back at it tomorrow. And that's something that I think allowed me to stay healthy. I love it. Well, Nate, I, I have one final question. I don't know if Ken does, but you know, the, the, listening to you talk, obviously, it just it it makes me so happy to that that everything that you've been taught, like you understand, and that's that to me says a lot about. Trevor and you're, and you're just, you're wanting, like being the sponge, wanting to understand and not just letting people work on you for the sake of just letting people work on you. But, you know, after you get done competing, like what, what's next for you? Like, what are you going to do? Is this in your future? 
<laughs> yeah, it, it, it could be. You know, I, I feel like I'm I'm torn between that and I do enjoy um, like public speaking and commentating, and I would love to be involved in the par- in the Paralympic movement. I think I would love if I could bring these resources to the Paralympic movement because a lot of times I feel like the Paralympic athletes don't get um, the same access or just don't um, have the opportunities. And so I would love to kind of show the Paralympic athletes how they can improve in the weight room. And that a lot of times I feel like a lot of athletes think like, especially runners, like I feel like you just get hurt in the weight room. Like it doesn't enhance your running, but it really does if you do it properly. Um, and so I would love to kind of be a bridge. And I also want to keep helping push the Paralympic movement forward because for me, that's so important. Like if one of my siblings, if something happened to them or – if I had a son or daughter and they were injured, I would want their opportunities to be better than I have now. And I want to be clear that our opportunities are fantastic of what of what we have now. But I feel like like anything, you always want it to be better and you always want it to be better, especially for the next next generation. And so that's kind of what I see myself doing. And hopefully I, uh, hopefully that'd be sweet if there was like a hybrid job where I could do commentating at the Paralympics and also kind of be involved on the weight room and uh coaching running side i feel like that would be probably a perfect job for me who knows that that opportunity will come up but uh, i'll uh, cross my fingers <laughs> nice you know nate um again we you know we wendy and i we really appreciate i know you guys have uh, have a relationship out, outside of the podcast and and being as far as being a guest here but i want to thank you personally for for framing um you know what you've been able to accomplish uh, with with running and how you've overcome adversity, I, I'm sure you've heard that a million times. Um, and, and to to be able to take advantage of of you know what training programs that are out there that can help somebody still become fully capable of com- competition at the highest level. So I want to I want to thank you for framing this and and putting in perspective that you know training doesn't have to be for somebody who's just got all you know full capacity but you know you're working with definitely you know what you have access to as far as what your your capabilities are allowing you to do today so really appreciate you being with us here today nate reach yeah thank you thank you so much for the opportunity and you know i just think i use my disability as the best thing that's ever happened to me and i feel like it's 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 great if life challenges you because you're only going to get better and like I said, thank you so much, uh, Ken and Wendy, for having me on, on the podcast. It was such an honor. And, um, you know, I'm part of the NASM family. So anytime I can do anything with NASM, I always, always jump at the chance. Yes, you are definitely a part of the family, Nate. So, <laughs> um, you know, again, you know, maybe we'll have you again, on again. I mean, just for for all the things that you're, you're, you're doing with with your training and what you're doing for your sport. So thank you again, Nate. So again, this is uh, Ken Miller, uh, Miss Wendy Bats, and we had special guest today, Mr. Nate Reach, gold medalist, 2020 Paralympics in Tokyo. So again, for all of you listening to us today on Random Fit, uh, if you like what you heard today, again, we had great guests, great information on what it takes to become an athlete at the highest level. Um, like, follow, subscribe to Random Fit, and until next time, take care and be well. Oh, 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 o